even in folks. Um, I thought it was time to probably do a Peerberg video about the 2e2. Um, I've had a fair number of people asking just little bits of information that no one should need to struggle to find. So hopefully this will help somebody. Um, they're just they're one of those things, one of those devices in history that just got a really bad rap. It's a bit like the K-series engine because they have a couple of problems. People don't like to fix them. So they just write them off and fuck a Weber on it instead. <laughs> um, that's basically the situation with the Peerberg. They they have a couple of bits and pieces that are unusual to how a normal carburetor works. And as a result, people end up throwing them away. I must apologise for the poor lighting situation, by the way. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's either uh, have that on or have no light. <laughs> so that's lighting up my workbench in front of me. So, But yeah, um, so... Basically, I'm just going to do a little talk around the bits that make a Peerberg do what it does. I've just grabbed a random one out of my box down there. I'll show you the box in a second because I'm probably going to need to cannibalise a couple more. And They're in various states of disassembly because I, I use these ones for spares. They're ones that have had too many component failures on them to warrant fixing. Um, so I swapped out the shell for something else and made good, you know. Um... So yeah, ho hopefully this will help somebody. Um, if it doesn't, I apologise. <laughs> Alrighty, as promised, there's the box of Peerbergs. Um, there's only four or five in there, but they were just too past it to warrant fixing, or they had some strange attachments to them. Again, that didn't really warrant fixing. Um, uh, so I just cannibalised them, what can I say? Anyway, so this guy is a good example to start out with, because... This Peerberg has had almost everything removed from it that makes it a Peerberg, like a 2E2 carburetor as you know and love, or dislike. So you've got your standard vacuum assisted second throttle stage, that's quite common. Um, obviously it's not bog standard, there are a lot of mechanicals out there, but it's quite common. Um, ignore this, that's the choke pull down unit, that's to do with the automatic choke, but they're a total nightmare to, repair, to remove without braking, so I just didn't bother. Anyway, so really... What makes a Peerberg different is all the stuff you don't see here. So, to this side, in the blue corner, you'll have um, what's known as a 3-4 point unit. It's called a 3-4 point unit because on some models it's got 3 points of extension, on some, point, on some models it's got 4. I believe it was automatics and air conditioned models that had the 4 point unit. So, fairly unusual, on a Rocco anyway. Um, so basically, this is controlled by vacuum, um, draws uh, an amount of vacuum through the venturi, and depending on the situation at hand, will control the throttle plate. Uh, now this is directly connected to the throttle itself, if I move it that side you can see it. So basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a throttle actuator, um, so that's, that's what that does. Um, three stages of operation generally. Um, mine has been running for the last 40,000 miles with only two, so it's not essential. So basically you've got cold start, uh, idle, and overrun cutoff. So mine's only got the cold start and idle at the moment because it's got a leak. So I don't have the overrun cutoff, but what should happen is essentially you've got a... Uh, oh shit, I don't think it's over, sorry. Ah, let's use this screw. So... That... Jesus, that, <laughs> that guy sits on the throttle plate. At cold start, when there's no vacuum, it's fully extended, right? It's done by a spring inside the diaphragm. That is pushing this throttle plate all the way out to the preset cold start speed, which is set by that guy there. Which you can set with a pair of pliers, by the way. Um, once it's got vacuum, uh, you've got a wax stat, a, a, a thermo time switch on the side. The thermo time switch remains open and doesn't allow the three-point unit to draw vacuum, which holds it at 2,000 RPM for up to 15 seconds, depending on the temperature. I've even had mine running at up to 30 seconds when it's been stupidly cold. But So that holds it up to two. That's basically just to get everything spinning, get oil flowing through, and just get a bit of, a bit of um, residual heat in the, uh, in, the, in the lump. It then draws back uh, to an idle speed, which lets this throttle plate come down. Now, 
this is where it starts to change into unusualness. So you come around this side. Now on the front you'd have a wax stat on here. Obviously they're hen's teeth and expensive to buy new so I don't think any of mine have actually got the wax stats on them. The wax stat is controlled by coolant flow so the hotter the coolant gets the more the wax expands and it pushes a pin in here and operates that lever. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see that guys, I'm really sorry about that. Um, just bugger, what a nightmare. It's in there. Anyway, you, you'll see it on your Peerberg. It's in there um, and it's attached to this spring which is attached to that guy. Now what this does this wedges against the throttle and holds it open like that. Now as the wax stat opens it pushes that way which forces this to close that way and allows the throttle to close. Okay, So that's when we come back to this side. This then comes to rest on the end of the three point unit and that wedges it in place at the idle speed. Now if you've got your overrun cutoff set up working on your three point unit, when you turn the engine off, there'll be a moment where that draws back and slams the throttle completely shut. And that's to cut off fuel to stop the engine from running on. Uh, it's also used above 1200 RPM uh, to stop the carburetor pointlessly flinging fuel into the engine when it doesn't need to because you're on the overrun. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what that guy does, basically. It's a, it's a glorified fuel cut off switch come uh, the accelerator end of a choke lever so that again so you start out with the engine off no vacuums present which means that that three point unit is holding this throttle plate open at 2000 rpm the thermo time switch which is normally mount mounted up here somewhere so a little disc with two vacuum ports in it will close once it reaches an ambient temperature of 15 degrees celsius if memory serves um, and that will draw the vacuum into the three point unit which pulls the actuator back so the, the, the brass cylinder pulls it back to maybe say this clearance it's not an exact science I'm afraid but anyway to about this clearance this and that will have a gap between them that's because by that point, the wax stat's taken over. Okay. The wax stat starts out obviously at the maximum withdrawal and allows the throttle to sit anywhere between 12 and 1600 RPM. Um, if you've got a boiling hot day outside and the coolant's warm, don't be surprised if you fire it up and it literally blips up to 2000 and drops straight to 1200 RPM. That's perfectly normal. When it's really cold, you might get a cold idle speed of anywhere up to, like I say, 1600 RPM. I've had 18 on mine on really, really cold mornings, but it always comes down to the right idle. So anyway, that wax that pushes that way on an arm that does that. And obviously, because it does that and is connected to this guy, that... I'm not sure how well you can see any of this. I'm sorry, guys. That will come up there allowing this throttle to close. Now, if you've got any problems with your initial cold start speed, um, which the chap who initially motivate, motivated me to make this video didn't seem to have, your adjustment lies here. Okay, So, if your cold start speed is too slow, you need to wind this in, or adjust the choke, but we'll talk about that in a minute. For now, we're just talking speed. Um, you need to wind this in if it's too slow, or out if it's too fast. Um, you can do that with a pair of pliers. Grab hold of this end. It's a bit of a faff, but worth it. Okay. Now, this guy. So, this end, you've got two separate... You see the, the gaps, the two witness marks, um, where you can see shiny brass. Those are Allen bolts, and they attach to this. Oh, God, this has been a godsend. You can find this thing as a PDF. Um... Do, 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 do GTI forum, Golf GTI forum, a chap called Rub Johnny shared this, and he has been a godsend when I was first learning how to do this. Um, so anyway, just uh, I might need to cut and come back to you guys because 
it's a big manual and I don't want to spill my beer trying to find it <laughs> BRB lol I can't apologise enough for the uh, the lol thing anyway so this is how the wax stack works in a diagram I didn't think to show you guys that so you can see you've got that bolt there that controls the actual amount of control that cam has on the throttle uh, I don't recommend touching this necessarily for the moment. Uh, you shouldn't need to. But if you're having problems with a fast idle once it goes down onto the wax stat, so we're past, we're past the point now where the, the diaphragm has drawn that cylinder in and you're idling too fast and it stays idling too fast, right? What you want to do is back to our donor Pierberg. So that there is the bolt that was shown on the diagram. This guy controls the throttle plate in relation to the wax stat. So it controls how open the throttle is in relation to how much push the wax stat's giving it. If it's too fast, when you undo this, obviously it's much easier when everything's locked in place by the other components that are supposed to be in the carb. As you can see, there's some free play there. You can go ahead and turn the throttle Undo that, uh, it's like a size, I think it's a 4, a four Allen key, size 4 Allen key, yeah, 4 mil I believe. Yeah, I'm sure it is in fact. Um, you can slacken that off, you don't have to undo it all the way, just slacken it off. If you want to raise the RPM open, or there you go, you can see it now. Or to slow the fast idle speed down, you can close that guy, right? So that'll get you your desired fast idle speed. It's an imprecise science, you may need to do it a couple of times obviously because different ambient temperatures and what have you, but that is the general rule so you can adjust your your fast idle, your cold idle speed like that and of course when you do that that's also moving this guy. So basically ideally in an ideal world what you want is 2000 RPM BAM down to sort of 12, 1600 RPM or what have you. Close this guy till it's 1200 RPM for now. Doesn't matter if it idles like shit, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, for now. So you close that guy and then the wax stack will continue to close the throttle still and you'll come down to the correct idle speed. So not only does it, that can solve both problems. That can solve your cold idle speed if it's too fast and your hot idle speed if it's too fast. Um, but you have to do it while the wax stat's still doing its thing. You can't do it at operating temperature. If you undo that screw at operating temperature, it pings open and it'll tick over at maybe 1800 RPM. You won't get it back until the engine's fully cooled down. So be warned, that will do that if... Yeah. So, cool. Uh, we'll have to pop onto my car in a minute because we're losing light. I did pick a bloody great time to do this, didn't I? Just a quick one. Um, I just need to find one of these guys with a choke housing on it. That'll do. Okay, this is a manual choke conversion, I believe. Oh no, it's just a, a weird type of auto choke. Or is it? It might be a manual choke. I don't know. Anyway, ignore all this bollocks. You'll have a like a dome-shaped housing on there. Now, just here, let me get the focus. You'll see there's dashes. Now, more often than not, that adjustment means that your choke plate is slammed shut. I guarantee you, your car will not run like this. It won't run right. Um, what you want to do is go ahead and loosen the at least two of the screws off and turn the choke housing anti-clockwise while it's cold, um, stone cold preferably. Uh, once you fire it, the second you fire it out, make your adjustments to the choke because it will always give you then the best cold start from stone cold uh, mixture wise. Open it slightly um, and just open it till it idles right because you'll notice that there'll be a pickup in idle speed because one of the things I had with this Not this particular one, but on my car It would pick up fine then it would idle like complete dog shit. It'd run on three cylinders It sounded like a v8 man. It was nice, but not what you want when you've got a four-cylinder <laughs> so It would idle like total crap. I mean it doesn't matter if your chokes there if the car runs right when it's cold who cares I mean, that, that choke's only there to provide you with the right mixture when the engine's stone cold and the fuel isn't atomising in the, in the manifold properly. If you open it out that way and it's atomising properly in the manifold, who gives a shit what it's meant to be, you know? Um, 
Very few of the Peerbergs I've set up have run on the correct choke settings. And it's nothing to do with idle mixture at warm idle either because they've all sat well within the specifications. It's just as they get older, I'm guessing, as they get older the channels in the carburetor are worn and they're dribbling too much fuel in and it runs too rich. So anyway, that's um, that's the uh, Peerberg off the car. Now I'm just going to make a very, very precise cut that I'm sure is really professional and then I'll move on to the Peerberg in the car. Right, so Susie's our uh, demonstrator for the day. So that's a Peerberg in situ. Um, this is mostly just in case anybody sees anything out of place on theirs. Um, I use this car as my daily drive. As you can see, it's not perfect. It's dirty. It's got a lot of gop in places. There's RTV in places, but it runs and it gets me to work every single day without a hitch. Uh, it's been sat for about four hours so far and the choke's still wide open, but when I come out here tomorrow, it'll probably sit somewhere in the region of thus. Because that's how the choke's happy. Um, I don't really know what. Ah, yes. In there. Take this fuel hose off in there could be a gauze filter throw it a fucking way totally totally useless completely useless all it does is restrict fuel flow and you don't need that <laughs> just get rid of it every pier bug i've ever had that's run like a bag of shit like with fuel starvation has been because of that filter throw it in the bin you'll thank me it costs nothing to try and it's not going to do any harm especially if you've got an inline filter as most of them have yes i'm running without a timing cover at the moment mine broke can't uh, can't afford to get another one right now, so uh, I don't know how well this is going to show up, but I'm going to try and film Pierbo going through its thing. Obviously, I've got the airbox disconnected right now, um, which is a bummer because this means vacuum leaks. I'll try and I'll try and plug it in, but honestly, it's just ah, oh, god damn it! <laughs> I've got to go and have dinner in a minute, so give me a minute. That guy should plug in there. That's good enough. Right, so. Who's up here, Big? Right. I'll just get my keys. And uh, my garage is such a shithole at the moment. Okay, so. I'll try my best to film the Peerberg doing its thing from this side, then go around to the other side. You should be able to see the actuator doing its thing. So that's. That guy there, you should be able to see that. I've modified mine so I take an 8mm nut just so I can adjust it easier. Right. Right, let's give this a whirl. I don't know if I'm going to have my, uh, get my arms shut in the door, no doubt, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. So, Godspeed, everyone. <laughs> Okay, so there's our gap. Let's now over to the wax tap. So that's what it should be doing. That's that's when you get your defined drop in RPM. I'm just going to go back into the garage. Okay, okay. So I don't know if I won't know until I go in and try and clip all this together somehow. Um, but I don't know if the audio came out alright on that. But basically. That's what your wax, what your three-point unit should be doing. So if it's not doing that, you've got a vacuum leak, and that's the part you need to get. Well, if it stays open like that, and doesn't ever close, or takes like hours to close, you need a new thermo time switch. Um, you're best off cannibalizing one of those off a used Peerberg. For the however much they are to buy. You could buy a whole Peerberg for 20 quid off someone who's listened to the fucking Weber Parade, who don't actually know what they're talking about when it comes to Peerbergs. Um, you could buy a perfectly good Peerberg for 20 quid and take it off of that. Um, so if it takes forever to close, that's your problem, because it's got a leak in the diaphragm. Um, if it closes but the idle speed's too fast, that'll be because your wax stat isn't set up right or one thing that is worth a crack before you start changing your uh, your settings is to take the wax stat off take the coolant hoses off of it undo the two screws take it out 
do this cold preferably. Boil the kettle in a jug, bucket in a jug of boiling water for 20 minutes. If the needle don't pop out, or a load of wax splurges out instead, your wax starts knackered. If not, there's your problem. Um, so, because they're supposed to expand, but I tell you, I've, I've saved, saved a couple, I've salvaged a couple um, by literally just doing that. So I've had a, my cousin, in fact, had a had a goal for the wax stat problem, and she bought a new wax stat, which was bought from a friend who decided to change over his setup on his car, and the Peerberg on that car was a Peerberg I rebuilt, and the wax stat on that I fixed. It was knackered. I fixed it by chucking it in a jug of boiling water, and it was it's still working fine on my cousin's car now, to the best of my knowledge. So, well worth a crack. Failing that, like I say, pop that Allen bolt and adjust it, but do it cold. If you do it when it's warmed up, the wax stat will push the throttle wide open, and then you'll have to turn it off and wait like hours for it to cool down again. Um, so that's worth a crack. I'm going to stop rabbiting on it. It's probably been really boring. <laughs> but anyway, I hope this helps at least somebody, because when I first decided I wanted my my car came with a Weber, and it ran like shit the whole fucking time, and I tried everything. New jets new car bases, endless tweaking, and it wasn't that. I stuck a Peterberg on there, mate, and it ran like a sewing machine. So, they're good carburetors. Give them a chance, for Christ's sake. Just give them a chance. They're damn sight cheaper to fix than a Weber is to buy. So, just my two cents. And failing that, just get in touch with me if you want to sell yours, because I've always need them for bits. Um, so, I hope that's been at least some use to someone. Um, like I say, I wish this information was around when I was learning how to work on them. So, anyway, if it's been helpful, great. If it hasn't, I apologise. So, have a cracking Friday, everyone. All the best. <laughs>